I really should begin by thanking uh, SAAA for having me here for this talk. It actually wasn't all that easy. I think the first time that they scheduled me to talk, I got horribly sick and had to cancel. And then there was another one that was a little bit less formal and, and actually getting it scheduled, but there was a, a conflict there as well. So I think this is the, the third opportunity finally here in the making. Um, before I jump right into the presentation, um, I just want to speak a little bit about how this came to be because it's actually kind of me. I, I was really getting tired of doing field archaeology terrestrial. I was working in the summer. It was hot in Missouri. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go off and I'm going to be an underwater archaeologist. You know, I'll never have to sweat. That'll be easy. And that really was the honest impetus for me going over and doing the underwater um, field school. Um, well, that and being in a very exotic place like Menorca, how, more, how much more fun can it get than that? Um, so where I'm going to go with this is really kind of an introduction to the geography, the history of Menorca, um, just a little bit of context, and then sort of glide into a narrative of my experience at the field school itself. All right. So here, here we have a basic map of Menorca. I'm going to focus on three main areas. Um, the capital city of Mahon, Ciutadella, a large city on the west coast. That's actually where our student residency was, uh, was placed at. And then also the Cactacavalaria, which is where the field school actually took place at. The entire island is about, it's a little less than 30 miles across it's about 10 miles, give or take, north to south. Um, so that kind of translated. We had to get, as I said, from uh, Ciutadella to the Capitacabalaria every morning to get to the dive site. So that the roads there aren't quite what they are here. And so it probably took about two hours or so each morning just to get to the dive sites. As far as the landscape is concerned, it, it reminded me a lot of like a California with very, very drastic relief, um, driving in and out of the mountains right on the coast. The, the west side of the island and the more northern part, so I guess I really should say the, the northwest, is the older, geologically, uh, the older part of the island, and a lot more calcareous rock on that side. And so there's a lot more fertile soil, a lot younger soils, on the southeastern side of the island. So unsurprisingly, there's a lot more prehistoric sites um, on the southeast, so closer to what is now the capital city, uh, a lot more from the Teleotic culture, which I'll talk about here briefly in a moment. Oops. Okay, so this is by no means exhaustive. This is just a very, very general breakdown, a good chronology of Menorca. It was first settled around 6,000 BC, the first evidence of pre-farming communities. Same thing that we deal with here in Native America. First evidence is chipped stone tools, um, very rudimentary artifacts. And then we move forward quite a bit into the Chocolithic, the initial Bronze Period settlements, um, a lot of evidence for more permanence. Um, we have our first domestic houses, evidence for uh, sedentism, and villages appearing closer to 1750 into 1300 BC. Shortly after that time, we have very active <coughs> trade going on with Mediterranean centers throughout the entire region, active trade, as it says there, with Carthage, the Punix, and the Giza uh, on the western side of the island chain, also with Rome. A lot changes uh, with the Roman conquest in 123 BC, a lot changes for Menorca's history, their trajectory, um, as it does throughout the rest of the Mediterranean world. Um, shortly thereafter for Menorca though, we have, oh, and I should mention um, before I get to it, a lot of the archeology, span both the maritime and the terrestrial that we dealt with was after the Roman conquest. So we're dealing right about the turn of the century there, the time of Christ, um, dealing in with the first through third century BC primarily, or excuse me, um, AD. But uh, getting back on track here, the, uh, followed by the Byzantine Empire, AD 
by 34 and to control by a couple different large powers that are moving through Europe at this time with the Cordobans, um, Islamic and Aragonese control later on in AD 1200. And then we have a long period of Spanish control followed by alternating Spanish and British control, which of course is what was going on in the late 18th century here in Florida as well. So, and again, that was part of the impetus for the Menorcans to travel over to Florida to begin with, is the area that they were in was very tumultuous and they were promised a, a much better life when getting here to Florida. Whether or not that actually occurred could probably be argued, but that's for another talk. <laughs> All right, um, this is a fantastic aerial of the dive site itself and what is the site of the ancient Roman city of San Isera, which is really the, the mainstay of the field school itself. It's where it gets its name. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But right here, this is the Echo Museum that hosts the field school. We have um, most of our dive site occurs out just outside of the bay there and we even have some British occupations this is a English watchtower and this is a British uh, fisherman's house right here so this is this is a good layout of where the ancient city once stood and I'm going to keep showing several different pictures so it's kind of a good um, reference point to keep thinking about or having your head as I move forward because you'll see a lot of these different sites from other angles, from the ground. <clears throat> okay, as I mentioned, um, this field school was a larger part of the Santa Sara Archaeological Institute, which at the time that I took it, they only had field schools in Spain, they only had them on Menorca. In the spring and in the fall, um, they hosted underwater archaeology field schools, and all summer long, they hosted terrestrial field school. Um, since then, they've expanded to multiple, I think there's eight countries now. They have a variety of things they do that you can see down there at the bottom, that they've got GIS, a maritime focus, a biological anthropology focus. Um, so they've really, really um, widened their scope of what it is they're able to do. But it's still hosted out of that small museum there in Menorca. The director of the museum is the, the director of the entire program. All right, so jumping in to give you some immediate context of the site itself, um, both terrestrial and underwater, the, the Roman city of San Sera really begins as an army barracks for Roman soldiers. Again, jumping back, or going back to that date, 123 BC at the time of the conquest. Um, it was the first time that they were ever able to really hold a strong, to, to gain a stronghold in that area. It was infested with pirates um, throughout the Mediterranean region, and that was their, their first real drive um, to stay there in that port. And we've, we've come to learn so much about it through a good combination of both terrestrial and maritime archaeology, and that's kind of where the dates come from is they've got so many potsherds, human remains, this huge diversity of artifacts that were excavated both on land and by sea, or under sea, I suppose I should say, that give it that tight date range of between the first and third century AD uh, based on all the work that was done there. And it really is cool because we have some of the first mention of this city from Pliny the Elder, who you know, some of you may be familiar with, who was the Roman naturalist and author, um, supposedly died during um, the, the eruptions in Pompeii. Um, so very cool stuff that he had mentioned this city and then it was kind of working the other direction. To put all the pieces together, we also have um, some descriptive maps from both the 16th 17th and 16th centuries um, showing the city. You can see right up here it says Senega, which is a known synonym of the city. I was in, in my readings about the, the site itself and had about 15 different names over time. 
which sounds pretty wild, but in this area of the world, over those couple thousand years, certainly not uncommon. And there it is labeled up at the top there, so it's pretty close. And just a, a little bit of extra context. This, if we remember that first photo that I showed, the, the aerial view, um, we have the English Watchtower constructed in 1857, and then also the Fisher's House that is still standing that was built in the late 18th century, which actually one day, I didn't even realize at the time, I found it in research later on, um, actually how old it was and, and what it was. We were just sitting on um, little benches inside of the house, eating lunch, and I had no idea of the um, historical significance. <clears throat> All right, moving on into the actual sort of field school experience itself. I got there and it was, I think I had just missed the, the bus station, or the, the last bus that went to the far west side of the island, so I had to wait for the next one on the schedule, so it was like another three hours. We all don't care about that, but that was kind of angry at the time. Anyway, <laughs> and still, whenever I see this picture, it makes me think of that. Um, so we were on the third floor up there at the top. Um, we had a local Menorcan woman who prepared our breakfast and our dinner each day. We had a sack lunch to take with us while we were diving, but the typical meal was something probably sausage or chicken, and then we had some form of hard bread and olive oil, a lot of um, rice and beans for most meals. She didn't speak any English, but was very, very, very friendly, and it was a good opportunity to, to practice my Spanish. Another funny story about the student residency is there were probably about 12 or so people in the field school, and we had two separate showers that were on different sides, and one of them had running hot water, one of them did not. I did not discover that there was one that had hot water until the last day of field school. So, <laughs> so I got one hot shower before I left. And I should mention that it was, we were there in November, so it, was, it wasn't warm. A, a high temperature was probably in the high 50s, low 60s. And the water temperature was probably barely warmer than that. So getting in and out of the wetsuit each morning, I, I'll never forget. <laughs> Quite cold. All right, that was our little, our little bus that we took. <laughs> from uh, one side of the island, uh, I guess, to the center of the island. The interesting thing about the bus, it was filled with flies. I'll never forget that. It was um, the entire time. I don't know if it was the time of year, or if it was just happenstance, or what it was, but it was, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it was quite an experience. Um, it was driven by the, the director of the Echo Museum. Um, I spent a lot of time just trying to sit in the front seat and talk to him because he actually didn't speak much English himself. Very, very, uh, very broken English. I'm still learning. So it was an opportunity and he had a lot of interesting things to say about the island and um, its people. He actually had his now wife, his girlfriend at the time that he was about to marry, was from California. And he lectures on the classical history after we were done diving every day. So he would say something in, in Catalan and then she would translate and that's how the courses were taught in the evening. But I hear that he's, he's much more proficient in English these days. But it's probably due to the success of his field schools. All right. Um, Moving through, um, the first day, of course, we had to go to the scoop shop and get geared up, get sized for everything. All, virtually no one brought their own equipment. We did We did have one gentleman who was a professional diver and had dived all over the world, and he was just really doing the course for fun. Um, but other than that, everyone was more, more of a, a newbie, I would say, or was, was getting their bearings to do underwater archaeology. Um, this is the director here, um, Fernando Contreras, who I just mentioned teaches all the courses. But he himself, at the time, did not dive. He was scared to dive, um, which I'm also told now he does. 
So uh, they contracted out some CRM, some maritime archaeologists from the UK um, to actually teach the field methods portions of the courses. Uh, this gentleman here is Rex. He's one of the archaeologists. There was another gentleman from Ireland who's not in the picture. But they were very, very quick to tell us that maritime archaeology is not all glamour and all that it's cracked up to be. They showed us many pictures of them diving in rivers and bogs in the UK and how, how much of a treat it was to dive in the clear waters off the coast of Menorca versus what they did for their daily jobs. <clears throat> and I guess before I move on, the students themselves, they were from all over the world. There were quite a few Americans, but there were some, uh, there was one guy from Japan, um, several from the UK, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there were students from Australia, so really, really all over. And some of the Americans I still talk to today, and this was back in 08, so pretty, pretty neat experience. We began before we ever got in the water, and if anybody's familiar with LAMP or how they train their underwater archaeologists, you do everything on land um, before you get in the water in terms of, of drawing, of mapping, of learning how to lay baselines, learning how to take measurements. You, you run through everything on land because once you get underwater, obviously, you're dealing with all of the elements and there, there could be surprises. So you, you want to make sure that you're very, very proficient on land before you get in the water to attempt anything. I apologize. I wish I had some pictures <coughs> of us actually doing the online training, but I didn't happen to, to get any. <clears throat> Okay, this is just another photo of the bay itself, and you can see again the English wash tower in the background. You can't quite make it out, but I think that's the fisherman's house there on the bay again, just opposite of the museum. And this is the bay itself. It was, again, it was November. It's kind of in a remote area, so I suspect, and from what I was told, there were a lot of more wealthy Spanish mainlanders that, that had sailboats and different vacation properties throughout the island, but we just didn't happen to see any of them, see any of them because it was the off season and really no one was around. We kind of had to bury it to ourselves, but it feels cool. Okay. Most of the dives that we did, we had some at the very, very end that were that were offshore and that were off a boat, but many of them were all from the shore itself, which if you've never done it, the first couple times is pretty difficult just because you're learning to get your bearings and trying to put on fins when if there's you know the tide's rolling in and you're it's crashing into you. It was almost like a, a bit of a training exercise in and of itself just to um, get in the water without making a fool of yourself. <clears throat> And this was another thing that we had to deal with um, every single morning that we were diving was just the transportation and loading and maintenance of all the tanks. So just I think I throw these in here just because it's a reminder of all of the work that, that goes into prepping and to, to doing underwater archaeology. There's so much involved when you're doing it on land, let alone um, when you're prepping to, to attempt to do things underwater. I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but one of the primary things that we focused on in the field school was locating amphora concentrations. If you're not familiar, amphora is a fancy word for the pottery of that time, usually transported um, via ship, held numerous liquids, usually wine or olive oil. Um, they have the funky shape with the point at the end because the way that they're held in ships, they have a ring around them, so they're actually held at the you near know, the top of the vessel, so they, they don't have to sit upright alone by themselves. They're important because they can help date the ship, date the shipwreck, date the concentration based on the design, the shape, um, and of course, this in turn can tell archaeologists where they were coming from, where it was headed to, what are the major trade routes, what are the the key players that are involved here. And of course, we have amphora that were made and transported between Italy, North Africa, Spain, um, really the entire pan Mediterranean world is transporting um, these liquids 
throughout the area. <clears throat> and in this individual photo, I'm, I'm standing on the bottom, which is usually is a no-no, don't do that. Um, but this is just a body shirt from a vessel that probably looked like this, so that's a testament to how big it was. It was probably about as tall as my chest, if, if it was a complete vessel. <clears throat> Once we identified um, some areas that had many, many amphora concentrations, um, the first thing to do was lay baselines and measure the site topography. So we would pick two, two points, maybe not entirely arbitrary, locate two points that were at the highest elevation, and then map everything that was lower than that. So what this diver here, I think this was my dive partner at the time, what he's doing is every meter or so he's taking a measurement down to the seafloor. So we're essentially creating a 2D topographic map of the layout of the site. And everything flying everywhere is all seaweed, which was a constant battle the whole time. <clears throat> this photograph is from Monarca, but it was not my field school, I stole it offline. <laughs> but it illustrates the next point that I'm about to make is when we're working on drawing certain aspects of a shipwreck or we've identified some, some important or significant feature that we wanted to, to be able to research further or investigate, uh, we would lay a grid down, um, just as simple as it looks, whether it was made out of metal or of, of some other material. And we would draw the shipwreck piece by piece, square by square. So this photograph, I'm, I'm actually lying on top of a small 19th century ship that's buried, that's buried in the sand. You can't see it um, because everything here is all covered in seaweed. It was visible to me at the time a little bit. Um, we actually had to do two dives just to get the seaweed out, um, to get it looking like that. So again, a testament to the time that it takes. Um, the, I've got a weight um, sitting on top of the clipboard so it doesn't float away. So this is, this was probably one of the moments when I realized I didn't want to be an underwater archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you're um, contending with elements such as this. But it really is a, um, a test of your, of your patience when you're trying to, to draw something. Um, with all of, there was a bad current that day as well, so you're getting swept around, and it's um, it's quite challenging. So I have all the respect in the world, and I tell them this all the time, all the folks at plant who do this sort of work day in and day out. <coughs> it wasn't all, it wasn't all field work, it wasn't all training. We did get, get to go out and do just some fun dives, do some exploration. They took us to some known sites. Um, there was an 18th century anchor um, that they took us out to. It's difficult to make out because we were we were so deep at the time. But there was a, my dive partner there, myself, and the very top of the anchor. Um, it was probably about four times uh, the size of me. So that's just if you can make it out. That's just the top of it there. On the first Saturday, we had the opportunity, um, that's Fernando, again there, who gave us a tour of a lot of the archaeological sites on the island, um, some of the ones that they were actually working on at the field school, and just some of the more famous, some of the better known sites on the island. I remember taking this photo because I was so taken aback. Um, in the United States, you probably wouldn't see this. This was just closed up for the winter time. Um, he came up and ripped off the tarp, and there were a, a big pile of human remains. It's multiple individuals there. It's not just one, and it speaks to the, the flexibility of their law, or perhaps the um, not the. It's not nearly as strict as it would be over here. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so they had the opportunity to to work with human remains there. <clears throat> This is one of the more famous cave sites dating to the Bronze Age, the Teleotic Bronze Age. 
um, that we had the opportunity to go walk inside, very beautiful, intricately carved, and just filled with modern graffiti, which is absolutely a shame. But there are so many people that come in and either spray paint or you know they draw hard and they write you know so and so we're both here things like that so i'd really like to see in the future that they would be able to cut down on that but it's difficult because it's kind of in a remote area itself and i'm sure they don't have the money to to pay for someone to stand there year round or at all hours of the day even okay this picture here is representative of a prehistoric Teleotic site. Um, the Teleotic culture gets its name from these Teleots, these T-structured monolithic, these huge stones here. They were kind of the, the centerpiece of their village, of, of, um, of the, the village's layout, when the entire city was constructed around it. Um, all of these piled up rock walls here those were all over the entire island, and, and actually many of them are still are still standing, are in, still in good condition, really. And it's unbelievable um, how old some some of them are, and still being around today. So it was fantastic to be able to to visit one of these sites, and a lot of them, or I shouldn't say a lot of them, at least one of them is a UNESCO heritage site. <coughs> That was the last day. That was the, the boat that we got to take out. And um, I think we have on the very far right side, there's Rex again, who taught the field methods. This was the other gentleman who helped teach field methods. And as I said, we had, we had many divers who were from, from all over the world. And um, of course, Fernando there at the, at the helm. The whole time he was on the boat, I, he acted like he'd never driven a boat before. He was just like, oh, copy time. I just <laughs> repeating it to himself. <laughs> it was a little scary at times, but we, we made it through. <laughs> one fun fact, since we're nearing the end, I had to throw in, is today one of the main things that the island's known for is its gin. It's interesting. It doesn't really taste like our gin or like gin in the UK. It's it's much sweeter, and a lot of people just drink it on the rocks or drink it straight up. Um, and then it's used to drink the island drink pomada, which is just simply a mixture of their gin and their lemonade. So virtually every single restaurant in town, or at least every what we would call a sit down restaurant, would have sangria, and they would and then have pomada. And all the servers would they would expect that you would you would order one of those two 